Okay, so thank you very much for attending this webinar. We're very pleased and very happy to have Associate Professor Jose Alberto Placasi da Silva, who's going to talk to us about 3D printing uh, enabling the fabrication of low cost microfluidic devices. So just briefly, I will, um, I will, I will uh, tell you a little bit about the trajectory of Professor uh, Alberto Fracassi, and then we'll just, uh, I'll just pass to him. So uh, Professor Fracassi graduated in chemistry from the Sao Paulo University in 1996, where he also received his PhD in analytical chemistry in 2001. Uh, this was followed by, by a postdoctoral position at the Laboratory of Integrated Systems at the Polytechnic School in the University of Sao Paulo. In 2004, he obtained a position at State University of Campinas, UNICAMP in Campinas, Sao Paulo. And in 2010, he was a visiting scholar at the Rolf Adams Institute for Bioanalytical Chemistry at the University of Kansas in the USA. At present, he is Associate Professor at the Chemistry Institute and Associate Director at the Center for Semiconductor uh, Components and Nanotechnology, both at UNICAM. His main research interests are focused on bioanalytical applications involving oxygen and nitrogen reactive uh, species instrumentation and methods for capillary electrophoresis and microfabrication strategies and materials for lab on a chip microsystems and integrated sensors. So very interesting research. I'm very happy that you agreed to be with us, um, Alberto. So I will, uh, without further ado, I will just um, give it to you. So I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, you're free to share your screen. Can you see my screen? Perfect. That's okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, thank you, Elisa. Thank you so much for this kind introduction and also for Springer Nature uh, Applied Sciences for uh, the invitation and honor to participate in this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, first, let me uh, just uh, give you some uh, information about our group. This is a group of electrophoresis and microsystems that we share with Professor Dozil Pereira Jesus that is present here today. Thank you for, for coming, Dozil. And uh, we are uh, interested on the, in this research topics, capillary electrophoresis, uh, microfluid device, development of microfluid device, and uh, coupling uh, electrochemical detection for both capillary and microfluid device, and also fluorescence detection, mostly for uh, microfluid device. And um, most of the applications, but not limited to, for bioanalysis. So we are working uh, strongly on the applications involving bioanalysis. And uh, concerning the 3D printing, we are we started working uh, on 3D printing a few years ago uh, in a way to help to develop microfluid device. So I hope I could share with with you now. It's more of a passion than a research topic for me because uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, 3D printing is really amazing. I will try to show you why I, I think that. For example, uh, virtually any kind of object can be printed uh, using this uh, combined techniques of 3D printing from really, really tiny objects. This is a, a kind of a structure with uh, less than one micrometer in, uh, in, the, in dimension with the, with the resolution actually. At the bar here uh, points to one micron. Uh, here you can see a statue over a hair and, and or on a, on a needle. So this is really, really tiny objects that you can uh, prepare uh, using 3D printing, but not limited to this tiny object. You can print large objects. For example, this is a, 3D printed house, actually 3D printed house. So it is amazing the, how can you scale the, this, this, uh, 
these techniques to get smaller and a bigger uh, objects. Uh, the global market for 3D printing, the, the forecast is about 27.5 uh, billion in 2024, and only for magical devices, 6.6 .6 billion in 2023. But this is an example of a picture of a, of a device for a DNA separation that appeared on the analytical science, the image of the mounts. So the, the idea, the motivation of our work is the production of these complex uh, microfluid devices using low cost instrumentation and simplified um, steps. Um, I'm working on the preparation of microfluid device uh, probably now for 20 years. And uh, uh, the, the convention techniques use uh, clean room facilities. You can see here a picture of uh, preparation of microchips inside the clean room. So it's really, really expensive to keep this structure to prepare micro device. So if you can uh, have an alternative to prepare reproducible and uh, low cost, and um, also with uh, many different features in a single device, using you know, a computer in a single machine is uh, really amazing. So uh, in general, 3D printing uh, follows these steps. So you have to project your object in a CAG uh, software. So we have uh, many options of CAG software. So OpenSCAD, AutoCAD, Inventor, Fusion, SolidWorks, for example. And you uh, save your project in a, in a format that is point, point, uh, .stl. So this, this file will send to another program that will generate this G code. The G code will inform to the machine what's the root of the, of the object will follow during the preparation. And, 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 and here you can, um, uh, you can keep control of many parameters that will uh, improve the, the printing. So this is a really important step to control the, the best way to print the object. Uh, this is a, it's, it's called a additive manufacture. So you print the object layer by layer uh, using this, this kind of uh, G-code generation. So from the G-code generation, there are many of uh, software that's usually come with the printer. Each printer has a, most, this, um, this, um, the own uh, proprietary G, uh, slicer. The slicer is the software that will do this. And uh, finally, you send this to the printer. And uh, you have many different techniques. For example, fuse deposition modeling, FGM, stereolithography, SLA, inkjet or multi-jet printer, uh, selective laser sintering, digital light processing, and even lamination is considered 3D printing technique. It's a little different from the others, but uh, it's also considered. So uh, today, uh, I, I would like to show you uh, some uh, work of the groups, of the group uh, using the fused deposition modeling and digital light processing. So in this case, uh, preparing micro, mix, micro mixer for bioanalytic applications and nanoparticle synthesis and the GLP techniques for cell culture and manipulation, contactless conductive detection and parametric detection. So uh, starting with the FGM. So if you're not familiar to this uh, 3D printing techniques, in this technique, we have a filament that is uh, fed into the a uh, heat, uh, uh, heated block. This heated block will fuse the, the filament and the filament will be extruded through a nozzle. So if you control the movement of the nozzle and also the movement of the platform, you can uh, create layer by layer the, the, the object. So here you have a, a, an example of the printer working. This is one of the printers we have there at the lab. And uh, this is the final device. This is uh, just a kind of a reactor uh, compartment uh, with uh, different geometries. So you can just uh, 
actually print um, many objects at the same time to speed, speed the process. So it's a pretty simple uh, technique actually. Uh, here it is interesting that you can combine uh, two or more filaments to get uh, multi-material deposition. So this is another interesting uh, feature of the FGM technique. So uh, when I started working with this with the Lucas, Lucas was um, a PhD student that finished actually in on March this year. So we, we got uh, devices with, uh, with channels embedded inside the, 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 the body of the device, but uh, it was too difficult to visualize the flows inside the channel. Since we want we use this for cell visualization and also optical detection, uh, we'd like to have more clear uh, channels to, to visualize these flows inside the channels. So we start to produce uh, some device uh, that were glued to glass slides. So uh, we put a adhesion layer and put this material over the glass slide. But uh, this is not a good strategy because the addition of the device to the glass is not very good. Actually, the, the, the printer has a, a bed that is made of glass, uh, mainly because uh, you can remove the device easily. So this is not a bad strategy. Uh, we, we, we found that uh, if you use, uh, instead of a glass slide, uh, a polymethyl metacrylate uh, substrate and print the device all over this um, PMMA substrate, we got a really good addition. So it actually it's not possible to remove the device from the PMMA um, substrate because you destroyed the the, the device. So the addition is, is, is really, really good. So using this, we just print the device with an open channel over the project is, is a device with open channel and we print directly onto the PMMAs to get the sealed channel. So this is one more interesting feature of uh, 3D printing. We don't, don't have to seal the device after the preparation. So we can do this uh, during the process. This is really, really interesting when you're preparing uh, microfluid devices. So uh, the next step to, after we get uh, clear windows to visualize the channels uh, was uh, address the or improve the XY resolution. We'd like to have micro channels. And uh, at that point, mostly of the works uh, show with uh, micro devices with um, maybe 400 micros, 500 micros. That is too big. Uh, if you want to use this with a capillary electrophoresis, we need smaller channels. So we start to work on the improvement of the resolution of the printer. And uh, the first uh, attempt we, we made were, uh, was to reduce the nozzle diameter so usually the printers come with a 0.4 millimeters diameter hole. Uh, we change this to 0.2 millimeter that improved a lot the resolution. So you can see here uh, channels. This is a solution with the food dye. Uh, with uh, 355 microns in width, here 138 and here uh, 85 microns. You can see really nice channels with, uh, with less than 100 microns that are really interesting. Uh, as I said before, uh, one inter uh, important uh, aspect is to control how the, the filament will be deposited on the, on the surface. So you can control this on the slicer and uh, to, to get better results. There are a lot of parameters to control, so we will not address this here today because it's really uh, um, too, too many too many parameters. But you can find the, the all the information on the on the published paper. So, for example, this one uh, is a slicer that is free. This is a hepatitis host, 
but you cannot control all the all the parameters. So uh, when you change it to this slicer, this is simplified 3G, we could get much better results. So uh, we start preparing some uh, micro mixers to apply this on different uh, situations in bioanalysis or analysis in general. So this is a common, a common design. So we have a serpentine channel that mixes two liquids. Uh, and at, at, at one point you have here a, a window for detection. So you can see here the two flows uh, uh, coming in contact on, in this region here or here, you can see here. And um, ahead on the channel, you have the mixing of these two flows uh, by diffusion, usually, because the Reynolds numbers in uh, microfluid devices really low. Usually have laminar flows in these in this, uh, channels. So here is uh, for optical detection, but we can also apply fluorescence detection. So here's a fluorescein and a water on the other uh, channel, so mixing to get this uh, smaller fluorescence signal. Uh, so using this strategy, you can combine different uh, applications that requires the mixing of two liquids, for example. And another uh, interesting thing that you can do easily in the, using 3D printing is to adjust the optical path for the detection. So if you have a really large concentrated solution, you can use this smaller path and if you have a diluted solution, you can use a larger path to increase the, the detectability. Uh, okay, so uh, just showing you some um, applications. This is the detection of nitrite using the grease reaction. Grease reaction uh, produces a, a, a color uh, as a compound. So increasing the concentration of nitrite, you increase this, the concentration of this azo compound. So you have this increasing on the color of the solution. Um, we, did, we did this in a, on a microscope, is an inverted microscope and using a CCG camera. So we'll get the picture of the, of the channel with the color uh, using the illumination of the microscope. Of course, you have to control this because uh, if you change the illumination, you have you have uh, different results. But keeping all this uh, constant, you can calibrate the system and get a really really good correlation with the G channel. You can separate the the color green, the color blue, and the color red from the CCG camera, and uh, calibrate um, the the system using these uh, channels, the green, green, blue, or red. So in this case, the green is the better, is the better sensitivity for the, for the detection. Um, here uh, is application for detection of proteins is the bread for uh, assay. The bread for assay is uh, based on a Comasi blue uh, shift on the peak uh, of absorption peak. So if the common blue uh, attached to the protein, we have this shift, you can measure this. It's difficult to see here uh, visually, but uh, when you get the, the, the picture on the, on the CCG camera, you can see a, a change on the red channel. So you can correlate good with the protein concentrations. So it's a total protein assay of uh, bread for assay. Here is an application for uh, fluorescence detection of uh, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is important for many, in many uh, uh, biological um, uh, metabolisms. For example, vasodilation and uh, signal, uh, cell signaling and uh, neurotransmission. Uh, so it's really important, inflammation. Uh, so here you can see, this is a different uh, reaction. So we react uh, the nitric oxide with the uh, fluorescent probe. This fluorescent probe is not fluorescent, but uh, reacting with NO produce this benzotriazole derivative that is fluorescent. So you can see the fluorescence here at around the 
515 uh, nanometers. So this is the blank and to 10, 15, 25 micromolar. Uh, this is direct detection of the green light. So you can um, calibrate with the green channel. Well, one, one other thing you can see here is the blank is not um, uh, zero. So you have a fluorescence of the substrate that you are using. In this case, the substrate was uh, polylactic acid. This one kind of very popular filament for uh, 3D printing. But even uh, with this uh, background fluorescence, we can have a much better uh, resolution of the channel uh, when you use this window. PMMA window compared to the whole ship prepared in the polylactic acid. We also apply this for electrophoresis actually. So applying a voltage and uh, seeing here the, the band passing through the detection window and to get this uh, into an electrophorogram that is interest for us to see the separation integration. Uh, we, we also developed uh, some uh, software tools to transform the video into an uh, electrophorogram. So this is a picture of the, of the system working. And this is another application for cell visualization. So we prepared this um, microfluid device with uh, small uh, wheels here. So the cells can be loaded into the microchip and the cells are trapped here on this on these uh, wheels and you can visualize the cells each of the compartments if you if you want in the the fluorescence microscope uh, here is a picture of the saccharomyces cerevisi the yeast uh, tanned with fluorescein this is a, a photo on the glass slide and here is the photo inside the the, the microchip so it's is really interesting that you can visualize uh, with uh, good clearness the, the, the cells inside the device. Okay, so uh, another uh, application is the uh, production of nanoparticles that we're working uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the lab because uh, nanoparticles have uh, many, many applications, for example, for sensor development, uh, drug delivery, um, uh, diagnosis, uh, cell analysis, the surface in acid, Hammond spectroscopy, for catalysis and electroanalysis. So, uh, and one nice thing that um, feature of microfluid is that we can control uh, the flows of the metal. Um, precursor and also the reductant to get uh, particles uh, in a very controllable size. So this is one example of the, of the device. is an expansion of that uh, last micromixer. So we have here one micromixer, micromixer and a second uh, part here that can combine the two or more uh, reactions. So the system is also uh, very simple. We have this two power supplies. One power supply control a pilcher device here. It's a thermoelectrical cooler uh, on, on the bottle that you can control the, the temperature. Here is a, just a heat dissipator. And here he, he is uh, the, the microfluid device on the top of the pilcher. So in, the, in this example, we have here the inlet for the metro, metal precursor that's mixed here with uh, mineral oil. Uh, here is the inlet of the reductant. So they mix it here in this region. So uh, each region here is, is spaced by the mineral oil. So each of these uh, regions are uh, individual reactor. So we are producing uh, particles here, here, here. And they are mixing on the on the serpentine channel to the outlet. So you can see also the, the features of the of the device. So here is a, a video of the device working. So here is the, the two uh, solutions that are mixed before the combining with the mineral oil. 
So they start mixing before the mineral oil. We found that the, the mineral oil helps a lot uh, to prevent the deposition of particles on, on the device. If you do this without the, the mineral oil, the particles start to depositing on the channels. So first we lost the, the part of the, the, of the, uh, the particles on, on the device. And also the device uh, after some time will be damaged. So this increased a lot the reproducibility of the preparation and also the lifetime of the device. That is not expensive. This, this device is estimated to cost about uh, uh, less than one euro, probably. Oh, uh, so uh, he, here you can see uh, examples of the preparations of the particles. So this is for uh, silver nanoparticle. You can see uh, the distribution, really, really narrow distribution of size. For example, five plus minus two nanometers. Here seven plus minus one nanometer. Here also seven plus minus one. And here eight plus minus three. So uh, just combining the concentration of, react, of the reagents and also the flows, you can adjust the size of the particles you want. So this is interesting. It's much more easy to control in a microfluid uh, uh, environment than, than uh, in a batch reaction because it's really large. You can, it's difficult to control the, the mixing. So it's much easier on a microfluid device. Here an example for uh, gold nanoparticles with a 34 uh, nanometers, 30, 20, uh, 30 uh, nanometers. It's also with a with a interesting uh, distribution of uh, of size. So we published this uh, results on the Microchemical Journal. Uh, we thank the the all the people involved in this work: the Lucas, uh, Jessica. Jessica is, uh, was a student from California that uh, made a kind of a stage there in the Unicamp. Uh, Christina, Heverson, Brenda, and also my colleague Dozi. So this is the, the, the work that we published on the Springer Nature Applied Sciences. That was a modification of this procedure to prepare core shell nanoparticles. So we prepared the first the nanoparticle gold seeds, gold nanoparticle seeds, introduce this on the microfluid device that react with, uh, with the uh, reductant to reduce silver over the gold nanoparticles. So we have uh, at the final this combined uh, particle. So just to show that the, the device is basically the same one. Uh, the difference is that uh, we, we, we put the reactant here, the silver nanoparticle uh, precursor here. These two flows, they mix on this serpentine. Uh, after this, we mix it with the uh, gold nanoparticle seeds and uh, they mix it together to get the, this combined particles. So this is different preparations. This is only the uh, gold nanoparticles. The three preparations of this uh, gold nanoparticles core with the silver shell. Uh, and here you can see uh, good reproducibility of the preparation. So the, the peak is shifted to the 400 nanometer indicating that this, um, this is a shell of uh, silver instead of gold that have this, this uh, maximum around here, 500 nanometer. Uh, but if, if you just uh, exaggerate on the uh, amount of silver, we start to agglomerate the particles and, and grow the particles. So we start to see another band here. So you can control uh, easily the conditions to prepare this kind of uh, uh, complex particles. Uh, this is an example of uh, metal, metal uh, particle, but you, but you can uh, cover or, or um, uh, coat the, the particle with the different uh, materials, for example, uh, polymer, uh, conductive or not uh, polymer. Um, 
recognizing elements, for example, aptamers, uh, antibodies. So this is a general procedure, but can be applied for many, many other situations. So you can see here the distribution uh, of the gold nanoparticles. And here you can see the, the distribution after the reaction. We can see that start to appear here uh, a second distribution. Uh, indicating that the size is, is shifting to bigger uh, part, nanoparticles. So the application of this, we just show for, showed for the modification of uh, electrochemical uh, electrodes. So we can put this uh, prepared particles over uh, carbon paste. So the carbon paste will be modified. This is a drop casting procedure. We put the drop on the surface of the electrode and let dry. So you have this particles um, on the adsorbed on the surface of the carbon paste. So here is the cyclic voltanogram for these two situations. This is just the carbon paste, and here the modified with the, with the particles. Here is the correlation of the uh, peak uh, current with the scan rate of the velocity of the uh, scan rate square root actually. So this is a pretty uh, well-behaved controlled by diffusion process. And here is more interesting to see the electrochemical impedance spectrum that you can see here a uh, spectra for the non-modified electrode here. And here is the modified electrode. So you can extract it from this, from this data the resistance of uh, charge transfer. So that is, is, a, is an, a measurement of how easy it is to transfer uh, electrons on the interface. So the, the charge, uh, resistance of charge transfer for the carbon paste is, uh, is around here, more than 15 kilo ohms. When you have this uh, modified electrode, you reduce this for about uh, seven or eight uh, kilo ohms. Here's an application for detection of thiocyanide. This is a square wave uh, voltammetry. So increasing the concentration of thiocyanide, you have this uh, increased uh, peak. So you can uh, quantify this uh, thiocyanide ions. So uh, we, we are um, further movement uh, for the production of this is to, to transform this in a one plane reactor in uh, different planes reactor, we call this uh, different flows, uh, floors. So we can have a, a really different condition of synthesis or reaction in this floor compared to this one. For, for example, an, one idea is to put uh, the Peltier device inside this device here. So we can uh, have one situation with a temperature completely different from the other temperature. That can be very useful when you, uh, when you need uh, different uh, conditions for the synthesis. For example, the last example for the core shell nanoparticles, the synthesis of gold nanoparticles happens about uh, 90 degrees Celsius. And, and the silver nanoparticle is about room temperature. So you can control uh, different uh, conditions uh, in different... Uh, flows of uh, in different floors of the of the device. So this is one thing that is really, really difficult to produce with the conventional uh, microfabrication techniques. So this is a multi-layer uh, channels. You have to combine many, many processes to do this in the conventional um, microfabrication procedures or protocols. And then you can do this really, really easily using 3D printing. So this is one, uh, another example. Thaisa is an undergraduate student that is conducting this uh, research at the group. So another uh, improvement on this uh, device that is uh, conducted by Heverson and Jessica. Actually, this, this paper were, uh, was submitted. So just waiting the response for the editor. And uh, 
Heverson and Jessica could here improve even more the resolution of the, of the process to get channels uh, as smaller as uh, 64 microns. That's really impressive for this kind of uh, technique. And uh, additionally, they could uh, prepare device with uh, astonishing transparency. It's almost uh, close to the glass light, this transparency. That's really, really interesting for the optical detection. Uh, I will not give details on, on this procedure because the paper is under evaluation. But uh, we hope that soon we can uh, share this, this uh, results. Okay, so uh, the next, uh, all of this uh, were made with the FGM, uh, uh, 3D printing technique. So now uh, we're gonna show you some example of a digital light processing uh, technique. So in this, in this type of technique, we have here a tank filled with uh, photosensitive resin. So uh, you, you, you uh, just uh, uh, applied some uh, light beam here on the tank. So the, the, the resin will polymerize under the, under the radiation action. So you can control, controlling the region that the radiation uh, reached the tank, so you can uh, build the, the, the device layer by layer like this. So you, you um, put the radiation, polymerize and uh, move up the, the stage. The difference between the GLP, digital light processing and uh, stereolithography is that the stereolithography usually use this uh, beam that is scanned the surface to build the object. In, in the GLP, the whole layer is exposed at the same time. So the, the, here, the speed is uh, a little faster than the SLA. So we start doing this for uh, particle separation. Actually, we would like to use this for cell separation. So thank Emily. Emily is a master uh, student that prepared this, um, this video. Let me try to put here. Oh yeah. Okay. So the idea is to have some uh, pillars here to filter these particles. So this is uh, bigger gaps and smaller gaps between the pillars here, smaller gaps between the pillars. So you can have uh, different compartments with, uh, with this uh, different size particles or cells in, in our case, to study the influence of the size of the cells, for example, the growth of the cells. And also for, separate, for separation or sorting of different types of cells. So let's go back here. Okay. So this is one example of the of the device that we're preparing prepared with this, uh, that design. So we still have some uh, kind of you know uh, difficulties to visualize the um, the the channels inside the the device. Uh, also, I have to note that we don't need to seal the device here because the, the device is completely sealed after um, process is finished. Uh, another thing that is you have to take care is about the projected um, or designed uh, uh, channels compared to the measured channels. So we have to calibrate the system to get the, the channels we, we desire. For example, here, it's pretty close. So we, we projected 200 micro channels, we get 200 micro. But here with the, this uh, resin, we projected uh, 200 microns, we get a, a channel smaller than 200. But this is not a problem, we just have to calibrate the system. So uh, we, we tried to improve the, the system, the, the, the printing conditions to get more uh, clear um, channels and also uh, improved uh, geometry of this uh, compartment. So here we have now rounded corners and, and we, we put this device over a glass slide to visualize better. 
So here you can see a much uh, clear uh, picture of the cells inside the, this chamber. Here is the edge of the one of these pillars. So this is another uh, improvement that uh, Emily made on the on the device. Uh, here you have the inlet with the uh, with the mix of the cells that pass to the pillar. The pillars are getting uh, closer when the um, uh, when the string uh, moves. So we, we trap here uh, bigger cells and uh, get here smaller cells. And this is a picture of the final uh, device. So one thing that uh, we noted uh, preparing this is that the roofiness of the of the chamber that the cells are placed are, are different depending on how you position the, the, the micro device. For example, this uh, wall of the device is, have more uh, roughness than the, this uh, side of the device. So if you visualize the device from this side, uh, you have this kind of, uh, of uh, visualization. And if you uh, see the, the, the channel from this side, you have this visualization. So here is difficult to see the cells, but here you can see the cells here. Yeah. So this is one thing that we're trying to understand better why this uh, this uh, surface is much more uh, rough rough than the the top layer. So maybe because we don't have a support to get this um, uh, soft, you know, uh, surface. But we, we are still uh, trying to understand what is happening to get this uh, increased roughness on this side of the device. So uh, here you can see uh, the, the cells inside the device using uh, this uh, more soft surface. And here, seeing through this more roughness uh, surface. There's a big difference, difference between these two visualizations. So uh, the next application is uh, is to integrate the electrochemical detection to this uh, GLP printed device. So this is start with, uh, with with my colleague from the Brinton Young University, Professor Adam Woolley. Adam really pushed the limit to the preparation of the truly microfluid device using GLP. So Adam. Uh, was successful to, to show that uh, channels as narrow as 18 microns per uh, 20 microns could be prepared using this technique. And, and this, um, tech, this uh, machine is a machine that, that is produced now by Acrea. Uh, it's a company from US. But it, due to this resolution, to the resolution is a, a little more expensive than the regular uh, GLP system that you can find on, on the market. But it's really, really, a really nice resolution. You can see here a complex uh, structure and here a, a, a photograph or a microscopy of the channel, section of the channels with a really good reproducibility. <laughs> So uh, in one conference, I just uh, talked to Adam when he showed these results and asked the, if it is possible for him to produce this kind of a device. It's a central channel, it's about 50 microns channel, with a surrounding channel. Uh, the, in, this, in this kind of surrounding channel, do not touch the, the, the inner channel. So we could use this kind of structure to put an electrode around the separation channel to use this for um, contactless conductive detection. That's one of the detection techniques we use there at the lab. So this is the, the idea of the channel. So a separation channel, here is a channel for injection, sample injection, and here we will have we have this uh, spiral um, channels around the, the separation channel for conductivity detection. So this was 
uh, about 2015 and uh, in 2019 we we have this uh, the device uh, ready so here's a picture of the central channel this is about 40 microns and here is the spiral channel around this this uh, separation channel so Brenda is a PhD student that uh, conducted this uh, studies there in the lab so after um, we feel it the the time is okay I have to finish five minutes okay let me go fast so we put a metal on, on inside the, the electrodes. So uh, you can see the metal here is gallium, melted gallium. We insert this on the electrodes to get this separation. So this is a picture of the instrumentation, really cheap instrumentation for the application of conductivity detection. Here a separation for potassium, sodium, lithium. And uh, we recently have this uh, published on the on the analytic and bioanalytical campus. If you want to check this, so uh, we also have another um, ways to put this uh, metal electrodes inside. For this is uh, electrolysis deposition. So this is nickel on the top of a uh, plastic that uses for the preparation of this device. And here in, inside the channel, here is nickel, here is copper. So we can just uh, have another procedures to do this using the um, 3D printing. So Brenda also prepared some uh, device containing uh, carbon paste, uh, filled channels for electrochemical detection coupled to the separation channel. Here the electrode is touching the separation channel for electrochemical detection. So here is a picture of the, the ready device for detection. Here is a picture of the electrode touching the separation channel. We also uh, characterized this uh, material that we prepared is about 8.6, 10 minus one uh, Siemens per centimeter. And uh, this is just uh, higher or, slow, or smaller then this uh, silver inks so this is, we are really uh, amazed with the results of this page we prepared so we applied this for um, detection inside the channel for kerosene methanol this is the cyclic voltammogram and here is the results for the square wave voltammogram for ferrocene methanol inside the, the micro channel so this is really interesting so uh, just to moving fast to conclusions, Elisa, sorry. So if you want me to compare the two techniques, so I will put this, this, uh, this slide. So the FGM in this corner, GLP in this corner. So regarding printer costs, so FGM is better. Material costs, FGM is better. Multi-material deposition, you FGM is uh, easier than uh, GLP. But GLP has uh, more spatial resolution and uh, surface roughness is better for GLP. So in, in conclusion, so uh, I think you could uh, show you the, the, the possibility of this 3D printing device for many different applications, cell culture mani manipulation, uh, bioanalysis, and uh, coupling of uh, fluorescence detection, uh, electrochemical detection for, the, 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 the imagination is the limit for application of this device. So finally, I would just like to thank you so much, the research group, all the people involved on the research group, my colleague here, Professor Dozil, also the colleagues from other um, universities, Professor Adam Woolley from Brinton Uni Young University, uh, Professor Anne Van and uh, Feti Bejui from Chimi Paris Tech, so we have a lot of collaboration on these fields. And uh, also, again, thank you so much for Springer Nation Applying Science for the invitation. And Elisa, thank you so much for the invitation for this webinar. So thank you so much. I finish no, here. No problem. I really enjoyed that uh, amazing talk. I, I, I could have just left you talking and talking more about the, so many different applications because it's really amazing everything that uh, you can do with these microfluidic devices.
Uh, thank you, uh, Alberto, for such a nice uh, presentation. So uh, I'm going to just um, maybe start if, if anyone has a question, just please go ahead and type it in the chat. I don't see at the moment any any questions, so I will just start asking. Uh, so I had quite a few comments because I was thinking of uh, the techniques that I know from my own area. And uh, I was wondering how um, how these compare with, for example, uh, using microfluidic devices. Um, I was I was wondering, uh, Alberto, whether you can. Uh, I'm sure that you can do it. I mean, you talked a little bit about it. That whether you can track uh, kinetics of nanoparticle synthesis, for example. I mean, you you mentioned something about diffusion limited processes, but say if you wanted to, for example, follow up the kinetics of the actual chemical reaction, can you do this from, from uh, your, your measurements? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's one uh, thing we are interested in, control the kinetic of reactions. We think about uh, actually the first uh, thing that comes to, to the head, is to the mind, is that to control the temperature of the, the process. So if you locally can control the temperature of the process, you can also interfere on the velocity of the reaction. But uh, you also can control the, the local uh, delivery of, of uh, reagents for the concentrations. So you can adjust this by uh, changing the flows. So we yeah. can uh, adjust the, 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 the concentrations. So this is one thing. And also the control the temperature. Yeah, that would be really interesting. And then the question would be how to track those kinetics, right? Because one thing that I could think, I mean, for, for chemists, uh, we like to do, you know, the classic techniques, IR, spectroscopy, uh, UVB spectroscopy, if it's something that has uh, emission in the, in the UVB spectrum. But I think, for example, is that, can you envision a way of uh, tracking this, uh, these reactions by NMR? Do you know if this, is, this has been done? Yes, yes. Uh, it's not for microchip, but uh, I remember one uh, one application in capillary electrophoresis that you can uh, have microcoils inside the mm -hmm. the system. So you have the the separation in capillary, and you can monitor by NMR uh, online. So you can do the same in the on the micro device. You can uh, place the micro device on the on the on the equipment, for example, to to measure this with microcoils. Uh, one of the things we we just uh, think um, for this uh, spiral electrodes uh, inside the uh, around the channel is oh, it would be possible to apply this radio frequency on this region to get the uh, NMR, but it did not. Um, uh, further uh, advance on this on this on this area, so it's not so easy to put this on the <laughs> on the equipment. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I actually thought about it when I, when you were presenting it, and then you mentioned this coil, and I thought, okay, that this is this would make absolute sense, but it would be really interesting, I think. Um, there are so many other techniques that you can do spatially. Yeah, well, it's possible in the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that we will see then papers coming up about this. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we have one question here, so I'm going to turn to that. Um, someone, uh, Gang, I cannot see the name, but is asking how to make the microfluidic chambers watertight and what is the mineral oil and surfactant used here in the slide 15? Hey, you mean watertight is resistant to water? Watertight, I, I don't, I, I did not understand what the... Uh... Let's see if, uh, can you, uh, it says is, if it's any leak prevention. Oh, leak, leak prevention. Yeah. Yeah, leak prevention is a, is a, is a, is a feature of the, the device because uh, the channel is completely uh, embedded on the device. This is not connections. There is not uh, parts to assemble. So you, you can do this inside the material. So the channel is prepared on the solid body. 
So there is no leakage. That is an interesting thing for this uh, 3D printing because one of the worst steps of microfabrication is the sealing. Mm. If you work on microfabrication, you know this. You can prepare really nice channels, but uh, sealing these channels is not easy in most protocols. So if you have a, uh, a procedure that you don't have to seal, this is a really interesting feature. And uh, mineral oil and surfactant. In this application, we did not use surfactants because we just want to separate the water plugs from the other water plugs. So, and also um, um, avoid the deposition of particles on the channel. So the oil just, uh, you know, uh, wet the surface of the device and uh, avoid this deposition. So we, we did not actually prepare a micro emulsion, but uh, it's just for the separation of these plugs and avoid the deposition. After you recover the solution at the outlet on a vial, so the, the phases are separated. You have the separated phases on the, on the vial and you get the, only the aqua solution with the nanoparticles. Great, thank you, Alberto. Uh, another question here from Dosu. What are the perspectives or improvements for 3D printing for developing microfluid devices? Well, we, we have a really nice resolution actually today, but the problem is the cost. For example, that, that companies that uh, produce uh, printers that uh, the principle is the two photon polymerization. Have you heard about this two photon polymerization? Mm -hmm. This gets these this amazing resolutions. So we have this uh, resolutions for the microfluid applications don't need to be so 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 high. So uh, you need the uh, twenty microns, uh, forty microns. But even for get reach this resolution, we the the cost of the machines are still high. So just just an example, one machine for prepare these spirals costs about uh, $200,000. And uh, a device, that green one that I show you uh, on the previous slide with the copper uh, deposition uh, was about uh, $1,000 $1, or less than this, but much more uh, cheaper. So I, I think that in the future, we will get a more uh, cheaper uh, printers that get this job uh, easier. So let, let's see. And also the multi-material uh, printers. So my dream is to have one machine that you just uh, project the, the, the device on your computer. So you have a, a polymer body with the embedded uh, electrode, micro electrode, uh, platinum electrode, and send this to the printer to get this final device. <laughs> so that's my dream. <laughs> it would be great. Uh, Alberto, I have so many more questions to ask. I think we could stay here uh, talking for a, for a long time because I think this is really nice what you can, what you can do with uh, these microfluidic devices. But uh, in the interest of, of time, I think uh, because we said that uh, the session would only last one hour and we don't want to take time, we know that everyone is so busy here. So I think with this, I, I will just thank you and thank the audience again for coming to this very nice webinar. And please, if you have further questions for Professor Alberto Fracassi, uh, uh, you can uh, shortly send him an email. You can find the paper uh, published in SN Applied Sciences. It's in the registration page when, uh, where you registered. And you can also contact us if you have any questions. If you want to submit a paper with us, you can uh, contact me or contact the journal directly. And thank you again for everyone. Thank you, Alberto, because this was amazing. Yeah, a lot of really nice science, very interesting and very uh, exciting. I really hope that, uh, that your dream will come true and that you have such a, a way of fabricating a device. And uh, we will be uh, 
having more webinars. So have a look at our page. We have really nice uh, topics coming up. And um, with uh, no further ado, I will, I will say thank you. And thank you, Alberto and the audience. Thank you so much for coming to this, to, to this webinar. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Bye-bye.